Welcome to Nazarene Israel. My name is Norman Willis, and you only need to watch this parasha if you want to survive the Great Tribulation. Stay with us. Last week, in Parashat Tetzaveh 2022, we showed how the decision to obey Yahweh's commandments, or not, is literally a life-and-death decision, because it indicates where our loyalties truly lie, and loyalty and allegiance, that's so important to a king. Are we loyal to Yahweh to the point where we listen diligently for His voice and obey everything His voice says, as well as His written word? because that's things he said before? Or are we not really listening diligently for his voice, and we're not really paying attention? We're not really doing everything it says, as well as what's written in his word. So are we, like King David, being diligent to keep all of his commandments eagerly, with haste, knowing that it pleases the Elohim that we love? Or are we perhaps still fleshly, still carnal? And like King Shaul, we're thinking we're obeying Yahweh's commandments, but really we're not. How many Ephraimites do we know like that, who really, they know deep in their hearts, they should be doing more, but they just never get around to it. Basically, they don't care enough to do it. How many times, brothers, how many times does Yahweh tell us that if we will listen diligently for his voice and submit to it 24-7 and guard all of his written commandments or the Torah, that we will be a special treasure unto him among everything that he owns. And basically, he considers anything less than that to be lukewarm or in other words, disloyal. You know, and do we know who Yahweh is? Yahweh is a war Elohim. He's the commander of our armies. So, can we understand that life and death would hang upon obeying our king's word? Because when you're in the army, either you obey your commander, or you're liable unto death. So, this week, in Parashat Ki Tisa 2022, we're going to see all over again that our ancestors never really were truly very committed to Yahweh and obeying His voice and obeying His written word. And the painful reason why, if we are willing to accept it, is they just didn't really love Yahweh. Not really. They couldn't have. They didn't even really know Him. And perhaps that's why they didn't do what he wanted. It's because basically they didn't care. Yahweh said, the main thing I want, he says it many times in the prophets, the main thing I wanted when I called you out of Mitzrayim is that you would hear my voice and be diligent to obey it and also obey all my written commands. But we didn't do that. We didn't appreciate what we'd been given. <clears throat> well, <clears throat> is there perhaps no one like that today in the house of Ephraim? Or among Judah, who is sojourning with us, is there no one like that among our ranks? Brothers, we are entering into the end times if we're not in them already. And there's just certain things that have got to get said for our people to survive as a people and to thrive as a people, and to do the job that's been given to us. And one of the things we need to learn from this parasha, again, is not that, ha ha, look how funny it is what our ancestors did. But let's notice, these are our ancestors. And if they had truly loved Yahweh Yeshua, they would have obeyed Yahweh Yeshua out of that love. But like King Shaul, our ancestors just thought that they were obeying Yahweh, when really they weren't loyal to him at all. They didn't seek his heart. 
are we seeking his heart? You know, brothers, just to say it, for some perspective, Yahweh made us. He gives us everything that we own, everything we have. He's like the great computer programmer in the heavens. And yet, even back in the Garden of Eden, we humans have continually rebelled against Yahweh. We've broken his commandments. We've ignored his words. We've obeyed that other voice instead. Well, let's remember, as we read about our ancestors, whose seed we are, we easily notice that our forefathers in Israel, or Ephraim, had a long history of rebelling against Yahweh, even though they thought they were doing great. I'm sure if you'd ask them, they thought they were keeping his Torah. But Yahweh didn't think they were doing great. Yahweh didn't think they were keeping his Torah. They all thought they were showing the fruits of love for him. But Yahweh didn't think that they were showing the fruits of love for him because they weren't hastening to keep all his commandments like King David had done. Well, Ephraim, brother, what about us? You know, do we understand that we were born into a generation's long spiritual war? And that even though maybe no one told us that we were born into a generation's long spiritual war, it doesn't change the fact There's a war going on, a spiritual war, and the very first thing that we need to do is to very clearly pick sides. There's no sitting on the fence. Okay, We need to decide if we, like the Levites, are going to be zealous for Yahweh and stand with Yahweh and side with Yahweh. Or are we, like our ancestors, going to be lukewarm and effectively not side with Yahweh because they don't have a lot of zeal for keeping his commandments. Well, the thing is, if we don't do what our king wants us to do, he's going to see us as traitors. So have we been under democracy so long that we've forgotten what it's like to serve a king? Do we even still understand what real kingship is all about? Do we understand that a king demands our absolute loyalty and obedience even unto the death? And that Elohim demands our absolute loyalty and obedience unto the death. They're kings. That's what kings do. They want our loyalty or they'll get their revenge. So that really, in the final analysis, either we have to choose to serve Yahweh or effectively by default we're going to end up serving Satan. Even if we're being lukewarm, we're not gathering with him, so we're scattering abroad. Either we're effectively building his kingdom together with him, or we're not. So if we call Yahweh our king, do we show him our allegiance by hastening to keep all his commandments that we can presently keep in the dispersion, Or are we not showing him our true allegiance by hastening to keep all of his commandments that we can presently keep in the dispersion? The question becomes, are we truly obedient or not truly obedient? 85% is not going to cut it. Now, earlier in this parasha series, we saw that if we're not listening to Yahweh's voice, And if we're not doing all that he says, then we are effectively obeying Satan's voice because we're not serving Yahweh. We're not building his kingdom. So who are we serving? Whose kingdom are we building by default? Because his kingdom doesn't get built. You know, brothers, we were bought with a price. We were made and created, and then he bought us again with a price. Shouldn't we behave like it? Well, in Shemuel Aleph, or 1 Samuel, chapter 15 and verse 23, Shemuel tells us that rebellion against Yahweh's voice, even by ignoring Yahweh's voice, 
is as the sin of witchcraft. Do we get that, why that is? How many Messianics, Ephraimites, Christians have we met? They have money for vacations, they have money for cars, they have money for extras, but they don't have any money to build Yeshua's unified kingdom. <laughs> and Yeshua tells us that wherever our heart is, that's where our treasure shall be also. And what that means is we spend our money on the things that we truly care about. So we can tell what are the things that we truly care about by what we spend money on. So is Yahweh the only item on our list? Or is there more? Does Yahweh have to compete with some other priorities? A boat, a car, a vacation, something we dream about? instead of Yahweh? Are we perhaps content to not put Yahweh first, perhaps because our children feel the need that they need to fit in with all the other children of the world all around them? The dances, the socials, the way they dress. Will their self-esteem perhaps be damaged if they don't play t-ball on the school team? You know, what if Elohim was keeping track of everything that we do and everything that we say. And what if he kept track of every time we lost connection with his son or broke or ignored one of his commandments? What if it's effectively like he's giving us all the rope in the world, basically, to see what we're going to do with it? Are we going to build him a great big fishing net to catch fish for him, to catch men? Or are we going to effectively do nothing and make a noose and hang ourselves because we weren't zealous for all of his commandments as King David was? You know, brothers, these are the end times. This is not a drill. This is not hypothetical. This is real world, so to speak. How do we get people's attentions? Yahweh is calling all of us to walk in humble relationship with him so that we can then plug ourselves into his framework. The Melchizedekian order is a service opportunity. And those of us who have the heart to serve, there is a framework that together we can build his unified global kingdom over which our children will then rule and reign with his rod of iron. But it's definitely a little red hen situation. Those of us who contribute to it those are the ones he's going to select for safety in the end times. Those of us who don't contribute to Yeshua's kingdom. How are we showing him loyalty? How are we showing him allegiance? How are we showing him dedication? Brothers, it's the end times. If we and our children are not zealous for establishing Yeshua's unified global kingdom, then how does he even know that we love him? Because he says, If you love me, then keep or guard or show mere my commandments. Because if we will do his commandments the way he says, if we will obey the fivefold ministry and the single foundation of apostles and prophets, the net result is that we're going to end up building him a unified global kingdom that's going to be so strong. We're going to rule and reign over the nations for a thousand years with his rod of iron. I don't know about you. That sounds like a wonderful thing for the world. That sounds like a thing people need is this kind of kingdom. One that's based on service and not selfish interest. But the only thing is that kind of a kingdom, it only works with people who love him enough to be diligent about hearing and obeying his voice. It won't work with any other people. So basically what he plans to do is to select for diligent obedience to his voice this time. The first time our forefathers left Mitzrayim, it was a big mess. And their bones all dropped in the wilderness. And it was the children who could come into the land. But The problem is in these end times, it's different this time. The children won't end up in the land if we ourselves don't raise them in the way they should go. 
because someone who's not raised in the way he should go, he won't make it to the land. That's what we're trying to say. It's different this time. So <laughs> Yahweh's, that's what he's doing. He's giving us rope. He's, he's letting us do anything that we want to do. And he's just sitting back and watching to see who truly loves him enough to pick up his cause. Who truly cares about him enough to seek his heart? What does he want? Are we talking to the Spirit and asking the Spirit, hmm, you know, what does Yeshua want? Yahweh, Father, what do you want for me? Father, would you please take away from me anything unpleasing to you? Father, would you please purify me? Would you, would you please help me to test myself and make sure that I'm in the faith? Please help me to diligently listen for your voice and hear your voice and hasten to do whatever your voice tells me to do and also hasten to keep all your written commandments. And as we're going to see, that is actually also the very best strategy I know of for surviving the Great Tribulation is to make Yahweh happy by listening, doing exactly what he says, listening continuously for his voice, and then doing everything he tells us to do, as well as his written commandments. Yeah. If we were soldiers in an army, would we hasten to perform the commandment of our commanding general? Our commander-in-chief gives us an order. Would we hasten to obey? Well, then what about the king of the universe? How much hastening are we doing to be careful to do everything that he says? Well, we've seen we are responsible for obeying all of his words. You know, and scripture gives us the golden rule, do unto others as we would have them do unto us. Perhaps we also need to be aware of what we call the golden calf rule. Do not do unto Yahweh your Elohim as our ancestors did unto him. Because again, Yahweh demands our loyalty. Yahweh demands our allegiance. He's a king. Our king expects us to defect from Satan and his kingdom. Say, we're done with that. And then he expects us to join ourselves to his nation, join his armies, and serve on his team to help build his son, the unified global kingdom, that his son will then turn and submit to him. So we're helping our husband please his father. And if we want the father's favor, then shouldn't we do what the father wants to have happen? You know, and not just that, but he wants to see us be all in. That's how he can know if we actually truly love him, is to lay down our lives in this world and to pick up Yeshua's burden. That's the fruit. That is the fruit. <laughs> we need to hear his voice and hasten to do what he says. Well, if we don't have kind of a sense of urgency to obey his voice, there's no sense of urgency for our Elohim, something is wrong. Because Yeshua tells us to work while it's still day, because the night is coming. We can't work. And we see those times rising in the headlines week by week. So Ephraim, brother, if there has ever been a time to get serious about our faith, Okay, can we talk about this? You know, and there's some things that need to be said. You know, another way Yahweh knows that we trust him, apart from keeping his commandments and he, obeying his voice, another way he can know that we're loyal to him is that we believe his word over man's word. Anytime Yahweh's words come into conflict with man's words, we have to go with Yahweh's words. That's the test. That's part of our testing. You know, and we have to interpret scripture correctly, but how many of us in Ephraim are still trusting man's word over Yahweh's word? How many of us are still turning to the doctors 
and pharmaceutical medicines instead of seeking Yahweh's remedies and seeking Yahweh's face. How many of us still believe in man-made Zionism, where the people get to serve as their own Messiah? They don't need Yeshua. How many of us are still in these mythologies? Well, in this parasha, we turn to Shemot, or Exodus chapter 30, starting in verse 23. What we're going to see is a direct contradiction in between what Yahweh's Torah says and what man's laws say today. We see a direct contradiction. So, Bereshit, or Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29, okay, Yahweh tells us that every plant that yields seed, which is on the face of all the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed, to us it shall be for food, or more correctly, for consumables. In other words, Every plant is clean. There's no difference between clean and unclean plants. Not like there is with animals. You'll see that in Leviticus 11. Now, obviously, we need to use wisdom in what we consume. We need to do things in a wise way. Uh, There are some plants that are poisonous if you eat them raw, but yet they have medicinal uses. Uh, For example, foxglove has a compound called digitalis. If you eat foxglove flowers straight with the digitalis, you might have heart problems and die. And yet the thing is, digitalis was used for many years to regulate heart function. It was originally derived from a plant. So likewise, aspirin was originally derived from the bark of the white willow tree. Now, obviously, we don't just make a meal of foxglove or we don't just eat white willow bark usually not, hopefully not. But the point is, they do have other medicinal uses and other uses. So one of the things that we see is that Yahweh commands us to make many things for him, for his tabernacle. And one of the things that Yahweh commands is that we anoint all these things with a special priestly anointing oil. And it's also to be used on Naharon and on his sons as the priests. So they will be anointed with this oil as part of their commission. Now, we're going to look at the ingredients of this oil. We'll look at the ingredients of what's called the ketoret, or the priestly incense, later in other chapters. But we're going to look at the contents of the priestly anointing oil right now, because what it's going to show us is this contradiction between how Yahweh looks at things and how Babylon or Egypt looks at things. So in Shemot chapter 30, verse 23, Yahweh says to take for ourselves quality spices for the priestly anointing oil, 500 shekels of liquid myrrh, half as much sweet-smelling cinnamon, meaning 250 shekels worth, and 250 shekels worth of sweet-smelling cane. Also, 500 shekels of cassia, which is the common cinnamon that most people use. We'll talk about that in just a minute. It says, according to the shekel of the sanctuary and a hin of olive oil. Verse 25, and you shall make from these a set-apart anointing oil, an ointment compounded according to the art of the perfumer. So it's supposed to smell good. He says, and it shall be a set-apart anointing oil. Verse 30, and you shall anoint Aharon and his sons and consecrate them that they may minister to me as priests. So it's this act of anointing and consecration that's a necessary part of being commissioned as a priest. Verse 31, And you shall speak to the children of Israel, saying, This shall be a set-apart anointing oil to me throughout your generations, meaning it's still set apart now. If we had a cleansed Levitical order and a cleansed temple, we could use it, but that's not for us. It's not for Melchizedekian order. This is Levitical order oil. We shouldn't make it. Verse 32, he says, It shall not be poured on man's flesh, nor shall you make any other like it according to its composition. It is set apart, and it shall be set apart to you. Uh, That means, kids, don't try this at home. Ephraim, don't replicate this oil, okay? 
it's okay. So if we're not supposed to replicate this oil, then don't we need to know what it is that we're not supposed to be replicating? And the reason I mention this is because uh, I've met people who make an attempt to replicate this oil and then to sell it. And that is specifically prohibited. So if you're going to watch this recipe, don't make this oil. I don't make this oil. I don't make this oil. Not a good move. Okay, so now let's look at the ingredients for the priestly anointing oil in Hebrew. And while we're here, let's also try to figure out what it is about these specific ingredients that Yahweh likes. Did we ever ask ourselves, why did Yahweh choose these spices? What is it about these particular spices that Yahweh likes and why? Well, okay, I asked those questions, so I'm going to share with you what I have learned. And I will say it's not at all what they taught me as a child in the Christian church. and It's also not what they teach you in school either. Okay, so the first ingredient is 500 shekels of liquid or pure myrrh. So myrrh is Strong's Hebrew Concordance or Old Testament 4753 more is spelled mem resh or mem vav resh, depending upon how you vowel point it. And it comes from a root of Strong's Hebrew 4843, marar, which refers to bitterness, something that's very, very bitter. And that's a very good description of more, myrrh. Uh, myrrh or more is very bitter. And well, so here we have some myrrh. Uh, basically, it's a tree sap except from a bush. So what they do is they, uh, this and frankincense, they scar the tree. Like for those of you in North America or North or Europe, that sometimes you'll collect uh, maple syrup or something from a tree. You'll, you'll collect some kinds of tree sap, but this is a bush sap or a bush resin. So they scar the, like with frankincense, they scar the bush, and then they come back later and they collect the resin. And they have a few different varieties. It grows in the Saudi Arabian Peninsula and in countries such as Oman. And now myrrh will show up again as an ingredient in the ketoret or the priestly incense. And we'll look at that when we get to that parasha. Uh, it was also one of the gifts that the wise men or the magi, the magicians, gave to Yeshua. Uh, but just to say it, and this will probably upset and offend a lot of people, the reason that myrrh or more was so popular and traded in ancient times, or I should say uh, many scholars believe that the reason it was so popular and traded in ancient times is that myrrh, like frankincense, is mildly psychoactive. So it's not exactly hallucinogenic, uh, but like frankincense, myrrh definitely has a mild alterative effect on one's perceptions and mood. Uh, you know, it's kind of like what they had back in the olden days when they didn't have television. Uh, we read the Tanakh, especially anything to having to do with King Solomon uh, and the wisdom of King Solomon. We see that King Solomon writes about Yahweh's plants a lot. Uh, King David also includes the plants. Uh, each one has a special medicinal characteristic. Uh, some people consider they have uh, various beneficial properties. If they're commanded in Scripture, do we know what they are? Okay, we could talk a long time about the components, but, uh, and this also just for show and tell, I suppose, uh, this is a piece of uh, Omani. I don't know if you can get a zoom on that, but uh, this is a piece of frankincense. It's the same kind of a thing. They scar the, the, it's a large shrub, large bush, large, small tree, and then they come back later and collect the resin. And again, there's various grades and styles and types, but that's how they do it. So verse 23 says to take half as much aromatic or sweet smelling cinnamon, meaning 250 shekels worth. Now, cinnamon is Strong's Hebrew 7076, kinamon. Now, it's not a big thing, but let's just, so this is not the kind of cinnamon that you buy for cheap at the grocery store. Let's see if we have... Uh, this is a uh, show and tell here. So this is the this is what most people will buy at the grocery stores. This is actually 
called cassia. Uh, so and we'll talk about cassia in just a moment because it also is one of the ingredients in the priestly anointing oil. Now, there is a, a lesser known cinnamon that is the actual kinamon. This is ground powder, uh, but this is sometimes what they call the true cinnamon or they call Ceylon cinnamon. And it's healthier for you than regular cinnamon. Uh, if you just use a little bit, uh, regular cinnamon is just fine. But if you're diabetic or something and you use a lot of cinnamon because cinnamon helps with diabetes and pre-diabetes, uh, then uh, yeah, this, this is good for a little bit and it's fine. But as far as uh, taking it internally, you want the Ceylon cinnamon and you pay a little more for it, but it's, it's cleaner and it's better for you. Uh, so again, we'll talk about the cassia or the Saigon cinnamon in a moment. Uh, but the next thing, the next ingredient is 250 shekels worth of an ingredient that the new King James version calls calamus. Now, uh, some scholars disagree about the use of this word. That's why we're taking things to the Hebrew. Uh, so we want to make sure we have the correct plant. So we look this up in the Hebrew, and it's actually two words. So the first word is Strong's Hebrew 7070. Good number there. Kane means cane. It's spelled kuf nun he. It comes from Strong's Hebrew 7069, referring to a reed or a cane, kane, cane, as a wreck or by resemblance, a rod, especially for measuring. Okay, so cane, cane. And the word for sweet smelling or aromatic is Strong's Hebrew 1314, which is bos, meaning fragrant or aromatic. And sometimes we'll see a doubling of the word bos. That You can do that in Hebrew. You make it double, and that means much more, like Ephraim is pre or afar, and it's plural so it, it becomes an intensive so when we see this doubling or this intensifying of the word bos now it becomes bosem in the plural and that means it's very fragrant cane so then we look up the reference in strong's hebrew 13 13 and it also refers to being very fragrant it says to compare it with the balsam plant probably because balsam plants are so fragrant uh, but that's part of the reason why balsam plants are so medicinal is that they have very uh, good relaxing aroma and it induce, induces healthy breathing. Uh, you know, and so when some people believe that our, the sound of our creator's name, Yahweh, is named after the sound of our respiration, how important is it to our walk that we breathe correctly? There's a lot of a lot of ways to hold your breath. And that's not that's not going according to the spirit. That's actually quenching the spirit. So don't hold your breath. Don't quench the spirit. Stay with Yeshua, no matter what happens. Place him first. And that connection with him. Place that first in all things, and never lose that. That's the true walk of a disciple, and that'll cause a lot of other things. Uh, but how important it is to breathe in this walk. So coming back to this word, the New King James Version, which I use, is not perfect. We try to mention whenever there's a, an inconsistency. The New King James Version suggests calamus as a possible meaning. And calamus is an interesting plant. Uh, now, I don't know if anyone has ever had what's called sweet flag tea, but that's made from calamus root. And calamus root also has what some would call a mild to medium psychoactive effect. Uh, again, it's not hallucinogenic, but there's definitely an alteration of perception and mood. Uh, now, it's a swamp plant, uh, the or a marsh, a marshy ground plant. Uh, the Society of Scent described calamus as having a unique scent of wet cake dough with a woody or leathery suede effect. Let's see, we have some calamus right here. Where is it? Oh, yes, yes. Let's see, it's a, a, a unique scent of wet cake dough. Oh, yes, with a, with a, a woody, leathery suede effect. Oh, yes, a, a very delicate bouquet. Yes. Um, <clears throat> well, the, the problem is that while calamus does have a unique scent, 
it doesn't have what I would call a very powerful or very strong scent. You know, you could call it fragrant because it's got an interesting fragrance and it was used in medieval times. They would uh, put them on the floors of their houses so you could, as you walked on it, you would smell the fragrance over time. But I, I wouldn't call it very fragrant. It's just basically kind of a marsh plant kind of a smell. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, not really what, I suppose you could call it a cane, but really there's a much better linguistic match for cane bows. And some people won't like this, so I say this understanding that this will offend a lot of people. But for us, at least, the better linguistic match for cane bows is cannabis. Cane bows, cannabis, it's the same word. I don't think linguistic matches get much closer than that. Uh, and cannabis truly is a fragrant cane. Uh, sometimes they even name some of the strains depending on how they smell, and they in induce certain smells and certain strains and this kind of a thing. Uh, so while I'm not a linguistic expert, at least to my untrained ear and to the ears of many others, it seems like cannabis is a much closer linguistic match for cane bows than calamus. Now, we also know that they found altars in ancient Israel with traces of cannabis on the altar. Uh, we'll talk about that again in just a moment. And we know that cannabis was widely traded in ancient times. And uh, we also know that there were no artificial restrictions on plants uh, like modern-day Babylon has today. We also know from Yehezkel or Ezekiel, chapter 27 and verse 19, that our forefathers traded fragrant cane probably along the Silk Road, which goes through uh, India, Pakistan, uh, the Hindu Kush, that kind of region. Also in Yeshayahu or Isaiah chapter 43 and verse 24, Yahweh complains at the people. They didn't bring him, meaning his priesthood, any fragrant cane with money. Okay, so, you know, so maybe then someone brought him some kane bows, Someone brought him some fragrant cane, meaning they gave it to the priesthood, because then we get to Yirmiyahu or Jeremiah chapter 6 and verse 10, and now Yahweh is wondering aloud, why did our forefathers even bother to bring him some fragrant cane from a distant country, like India or Pakistan? Because their hearts aren't right. So, you know, they found traces of cannabis on altars, in, a, in all ancient altars in Israel. So we know that this was offered as an ethnobotanical substance. So again, connect the dots. Yahweh is complaining the people don't bring his priests or him any fragrant cane. And then they bring him some. And he says, why are you doing this? Because you're, just, you're obeying this, but you're not obeying all those other things. Okay, well, Song of Solomon, chapter 4 and verse 14, we also learn that calamus, or rather cannabis, is a plant of love. Uh, and back when I lived in Israel, between 2003 and 2005, I was told by a Messianic Jewish brother that I had met that most of the rabbis know that cane bows is cannabis. And he said an undisclosed minority of them have a puff or two before they go to pray. Now, that's not anything but just information. Uh, sometimes people say, well, Norman, what, what do we do with this information? You know, wh what, are you, what are you saying? Are you saying Yahweh wants his priests to get altered before they attend to him at the altar? You know, what are you saying? And I'm not saying that. I'm just, uh, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that while most Babylonian Christian churches teach that fragrant cane is an evil drug plant that should be eradicated from the face of the earth. But they also at the same time teach that man-made chemical pharmaceuticals and things of that sort are okay. Uh, you know, and you could say, well, you know, I suppose that's a choice that, that they could make, except the only problem is that the scripture reads the exact opposite. Now, I want to give this the most responsible treatment that we can. Uh, but the problem is, and I understand that a lot of people have been raised a certain way to believe certain things, 
But when we take Scripture as our final authority, we kind of have to understand that Yahweh never places any restrictions on any plant that has seeds. Uh, Even though some of them have to be used medicinally, Yahweh never places restrictions on any plant that has seeds. Later, in in other parashiot, we will see that, yes, Yahweh does regulate alcohol. There are times it's okay to drink it, times it's not okay to drink it. And as we show in our study on cannabis and the Bible, in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 6, we're going to see that Yahweh prohibits, what he actually prohibits, is man-made chemical pharmaceuticals. From that study, we know that the drug sorcery that's prohibited in Hitgalut or Revelation chapter 21 is actually Strong's Greek number 5332, which refers not to plants, refers to man-made chemical pharmaceuticals, pharmakia, pharmaceuticals. Now, the thing is, Scripture never prohibits plants because Yahweh already told us back in Bereshit or Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29, that every plant that bears seed is consumable, at least under the right conditions. So why would he contradict that later? That makes no sense. Why would Yahweh say every plant bearing seed and then later say, oh, no, 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 no. Some plants are clean, some plants are not clean. No, all plants always have to be used wisely. Everything has to be used wisely. Wisdom, listening to the Spirit, that's part of our walk. Submitting to the Spirit, that's part of our walk. Anyway, if you want more details on that subject, please see our study on Cannabis and the Bible, which is located in Nazarene Scripture Studies, Volume 6. Now, To be complete, the final ingredient in the priestly anointing oil was also to contain 500 shekels of cassia. Uh, Cassia is what most people call cinnamon. Sometimes it's called Saigon cinnamon, but it's not Ceylon cinnamon. Uh, So, but again, before we go further, let's mention again, we should never, ever, ever make an anointing oil that has an olive base both kinds of cinnamon and cannabis. Okay, that is a very special oil for you, or, or calamus, depending upon your conviction. Oh, that's fine. But, but don't make this oil. This oil is set apart for a cleansed Levitical order in a cleansed Levitical temple. We should never make this oil on our own, and we don't need it in the Melchizedekian order. We're on a different system here. Uh, you know, so, and while we're on this topic of us and our forefathers doing things that we know we shouldn't do. Uh, Let's take a look at Shemot chapter 32. And again, as we talk about our ancestors' mistakes, it's so easy to laugh at what our forefathers did. But let's consider again uh, anything that might be in our lives that Yahweh might look at as an idol. Our forefathers were quick to put things in between themselves and Yahweh. An idol is anything that gets in between us and hearing and obeying Yahweh. He wants that relationship with him restored, that relationship that was lost in the Garden of Eden. We stopped obeying him. We stopped listening to him. If you're not going to listen to him, get out of his house. Now we want to go home to the land of Israel. What do we need to do? We need to pay attention to him. We need to listen when he talks. When he tells us something, we need to make notes. We need to do it. We need to keep, do, do we keep a list of the revelations, that things that Yahweh truly says to us? And not, there's a lot of people that think they're hearing a lot of things. They need to be careful to differentiate between Yahweh's voice and their voice. It's, wow. Be, be very, very careful. But what Yahweh wants is he doesn't want us to allow anything to get in between us and our relationship with him. Yeshua says, abide in me and I in you. Apart from me, you can do nothing. And if we're cut off as a branch because we're disconnected, we become withered. 
So anything that takes our focus off of Yeshua, anything that takes our focus off of Elohim, that's an idol. Something visible, especially visible, doesn't have to be visible, but just anything that we pay attention to more than Yahweh, that's an idol. You know, we got, we got Raggedy Ann, we got Raggedy Andreas, the Ephraimites, you know, Raggedy Ann and Andreas. So verses one through six, let's note our forefathers rebelled against Yahweh again. Did we listen? No. Did we obey? No. Okay, well, apparently our, for, our forefathers didn't like how long it was taking for Moshe to come back down from the mountain. So when Moshe was gone for 40 days, guess what? The children of Egypt, I mean, the children of Israel, uh, sorry, got them mixed up there for a moment. The children of Israel pleaded with Aharon to make them a golden calf so they'd have something visible to worship. They wanted an idol. And then they had a big feast for their idol. Oh, oh, and then they rose up to play. And there was singing and dancing, but nobody's doing what Yahweh said to do. Do you think maybe they didn't yet have a restored relationship with Elohim? Maybe they only had a relationship with Moshe. And so when Moshe was gone, they didn't look for Yahweh anymore. Like, you know, people that look to their pastor or people that look to their rabbi. <laughs> They're not paying attention to the scriptures. People who read the Talmud instead of reading their scriptures. You know, one day they'll probably shut this ministry down when there's a realization that it conflicts with the one world religion agenda. Uh, so the thing is, at some point, I may be gone for more than 40 days. I encourage everyone to download things as they come out, store them for future community. Our goal is to establish communities that are capable of operating independently so that when the ministry is shut down in the future, you will have the things that you need to share the good news with others. So download and store all the materials. But more than that, the most important thing, brother, sister, is to establish that indwelling relationship with Yeshua. That's the main thing. We fell from favor in the garden. And that, that indwelling relationship, well, that relationship, that close relationship, it was indwelling, we don't know. But that was lost in the Garden of Eden. And it's got to be restored and reestablished. So once we come into connection with Yeshua, that's what it means not to quench the Spirit. We have to follow the Spirit so we can follow Yeshua, so we can obey His voice. Well, and that way, if people understand that we're trying to develop a relationship with Yahweh through His Son, Yeshua, focusing on Yeshua, abiding in Him and Him in us, Him in the Father and the Father in Him, restoring that broken relationship. And then we have to submit to the Spirit. He won't make us. We have to invite the Spirit in. It has to be a conscious decision. We have to invite the Spirit in every day when we wake up and then stay with the Spirit all day. That's what we're supposed to be focusing on. Now, our ancestors, they were focusing on an idol and they're having such fun in their disobedience to Yahweh uh, right before they got slaughtered for it. Anyone see any parallels to now? Uh, kind of reminds us of how Yeshua described the days of Noah in Matthew chapter 24. People were feasting and giving in marriage and then came the destruction. So we can see it building. Shemot, Exodus chapter 32, starting in verse 1. Now, when the people saw that Moshe delayed coming down from the mountain, the people gathered together to Aharon and said to him, Come, make us Elohim that shall go before us. The column of fire and cloud would go before us, but now, as for this Moshe, He's the man who brought us up out of the land of Mitzrayim. We don't know what's become of him. So Aharon said, okay, give me all your golden earrings. So the people gave all their golden earrings to Aharon. 
and he fashioned it with an engraving tool and made a molded calf strictly against the ten words. And they said, This is your Elohim, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Mitzrayim. Woohoo! So when Aharon saw it, he built an altar before it. Now, we're probably talking the third, maybe the fourth month since being freed from the iron furnace in Egypt. And we're talking not too long after the public betrothal at Mount Sinai. So uh, this is Yahweh's bridal nation, our forefathers, quickly turning aside. And Aharon made a proclamation and said, Tomorrow is a feast to Yahweh. woo Party. 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 But Yahweh is not having any fun. That's because his set-apart bridal nation, he just got engaged to publicly for the whole world to see, chose to party without him. And if this is what our ancestors did, then, brothers and sisters, aren't we kind of prone to this same kind of thing? Verse 6, Then they rose early on the next day, offered burnt offerings, and brought peace offerings. And the people got together at a friend's house to break bread and have fellowship. I mean, and then they rose up to play with music and dancing, but not to hear Elohim's voice or to keep his written words because they didn't care about his written words. They're only interested in how the kingdom could benefit them. Therefore, they maintain their peacetime party attitude. That's how it reads, isn't it? But when Yahweh saw the children of Israel quickly turn aside from following his voice and his commandments, he was ready to consume all of our forefathers. Because why? Because he just sprung them from slavery in Egypt three, maybe four months before and said to them, turn away from Satan, turn away from building his kingdom, help build my son's kingdom. And if you will do that, just listen for what I say and follow my instructions. I'll walk you through it. And if you'll let me walk you through it, then you and your children are going to rule and reign over the earth for me, over the nations, as my body, as my bride. And if you'll do what I tell you to do, if you'll hear my voice and obey everything I say to you, you will be my special treasured possession in all the earth, and all the earth is mine, so I can do what I want. Well, so why are Yahweh's statutes and judgments so important to him if he owns everything? It's because literally these are things that we probably ordinarily wouldn't do in our flesh. If we're just in our flesh, what do we care about Yahweh? What do we care about our fellow man? So what Yahweh looks to see is someone like King David who hastens to keep his commandments that's when he's pleased with us because he knows we love him enough to hasten to do everything he says. But there are some messianics, sadly, and some who call themselves Nazarenes, and you know who you are, and they say, well, we're keeping the Torah, but we're not hastening to keep all of the commandments, just like our forefathers leaving Egypt Hmm. No, but we're, we don't have to do all the commandments. We're still keeping Torah, right? Because we're, we're resting on Shabbat and we're, we're taking turns reading. From the, that's still keeping Torah, right? You know, the thing is, Yahweh is like the ultimate design engineer. He knows how the car runs. He knows how, how everything fits together. So we need to obey his commandments. We need to obey his specifications. That's how his plan works. So, and he knows these are not things that we would ordinarily do on our own. He knows that the spirit and the flesh are opposites. 
So that's why he wants to see us keep his commandments is because this is going to show him whether or not we truly love him. Because these are not things we want to do in our flesh. These are not commandments we want to keep in our flesh. So this shows him. Do we care more about him and what he wants? Or do we care more about us and what we want? Oh, and we're just going to pretend that we're learning. Yeah, we're just learning, right? Okay, excuse me, Mystery Babylon. Ephraim, brother, if you're listening, okay, if you're out there and you're listening, Mystery Babylon is the worst place to be. Yaakov chapter 1, verse 22 tells us to be sure, to be doers of his word and not just hearers only, deceiving ourselves. You know, it gets pretty bad when you're the one who invites Satan in to deceive you. Because speaking the truth in love in these end times, brothers, there's a lot of Ephraimites, a lot of our people. They're following a broad, lukewarm, easy pathway that leads to destruction because it doesn't build Yeshua's kingdom, not in a real way. But there's a few, there's a few who are humbling themselves as little children and they're asking their daddy, to show them what does he want them to do? How does he want them to live? What are his ways? Father, please show me what you want me to do. And I know your son wants us to build his kingdom. That's what the parable of the meanness is all about. So who are the servants who obey him? And who are the servants who pretend to obey him? <laughs> you know, Yeshua is such a kind master. He's never going to force us to do anything. But the thing is, he's always watching. And let's not kid ourselves. There's a lot of people, I think, are kidding themselves. They're playing silly games with their eternal salvation is what they're doing. You know, Because when we get to the judgment, they're going to open books. And everything we did and everything we failed to do and everything we said, and everything we failed to say, that's all going to be recorded. They're going to watch the DVD of our lives, so to speak. And every flaw, every failure, you know. And, and what does he want? We, we say the safest place to be in the tribulation is in his will. What is his will? His will is what he wants, right? What does he want? He wants a kingdom for his son, right? So are we helping him get a kingdom for his son? Are we truly defectors from Satan's team and from building Satan's kingdom? Have we, have we truly hated Satan's kingdom so much we want to help build Yeshua's kingdom to give his people an alternative, some place to come. You know, sheep, if they're going to come somewhere, you got to have a pasture. You got to have a corral. You need a barn. There's things you need to serve sheep. But what if we're not eager to help our king establish his kingdom? What kind of treason is that? You know, he's a king. Disobeying the king's orders is a death penalty offense. When the king tells you to do something, you obey or that's it. You know, I mean, has it been so long since we lived under kingship that we don't understand the command is obey me or die? You know, what part of obey me or die do we not understand? And what part of obey me or die can we not understand applies to Yeshua because he was the messenger. He was the angel that was sent before us to lead us out of the land of Egypt. And he will not pardon. We're, we're not to provoke him because he will not 
pardon our transgressions because his father Yahweh's name is in him. So if Yahweh is a war Elohim, what part of obey my voice or die do we not understand? You know, Yahweh tells us again and again, constantly he tells us, listen for his voice, do what he tells us to do. That's it. He'll walk us through, but listen and do. And what, what earthly king even wouldn't want that? What earthly king wouldn't want his subjects listening diligently for the sound of his voice so they could obey it? Of course he wants that. He wants the people's allegiance. He wants the people's loyalties. He wants the people's attentions. Can we expect Yahweh to be different than that? We wouldn't dare disobey an earthly king's commandment. What about Yahweh? Oh, do we have other things that are more important to us to take care of before we have matters of obedience to our master and king? Well, you know, have we forgotten? Has it been that long? If we don't do what a king says, it's off with his head. But so why does Yahweh place so much emphasis on our obedience to his commandments? It's simple. It's because that's how he can know if we truly love him or not. Because it's a bunch of commands of things that we ordinarily wouldn't do in our flesh. A lot of the Torah commandments run directly contrary to our flesh. But these are things that are necessary if we're going to truly build a white horse nation for Yeshua that can overcome the enemies of Israel for a thousand years while Satan is locked away in the pit. But it takes discipline. doesn't necessarily take a lot of intelligence. doesn't necessarily take money. It takes discipline. And if we will discipline ourselves to be Yeshua's disciples and to obey what his spirit is telling us to do moment by moment. If we will obey him in the things he commands, he himself will be the one to put our enemies under our feet. It's not going to be easy. King David's life wasn't easy. Joshua's life wasn't easy. Moshe's life wasn't easy. Shaul, Shaliak Shaul, the Apostle Paul, his life wasn't easy. They all worked hard. They all risked their lives. But the thing is, they listened for Yahweh's voice, and they heard what Yahweh was saying, and they hastened to obey Yahweh's voice, because that's how you give him honor. When your king speaks, you hasten to accomplish it. But in contrast, King Shaul, like our forefathers, he turned aside quickly, and he and his son both died. Well, because our ancestors turned aside quickly, Israel received the Levitical order. And the reason why is because the Levites proved to be loyal. The Levites chose what Yahweh wanted rather than what they would want in their own flesh. Wow, what a decision that was. In Shemot chapter 32 and verse 8, Yahweh says of our forefathers, they have turned aside quickly. It's just a few months. They have turned aside quickly out of the way which I have commanded them. And they've made themselves a molded calf and worshipped it and sacrificed to it and said, this is your Elohim, O Israel, that brought you out of the land of Egypt. And Yahweh said to Moshe, I have seen this people, and indeed it is a stiff-necked people. Now, therefore, let me alone, that my wrath may burn hot against them, and I may consume them, and then I'll make of you a great nation. Because he can do that. Well, thankfully, praise Yahweh, Moshe then interceded for his brethren, 
He interceded for the nation and the people, and Yahweh relented. But verse 12 tells us that it was not for Israel's sake that Yahweh relented, because our forefathers were that stiff-necked, that stubborn. Rather, Yahweh relented for his name's sake, so that his enemies would no longer have anything to speak evil of him about. We're going to see this point made again in our half to a prophetic portion. You know, how important it is for us to behave in such a way that bring glory and honor to Yahweh's name. It's in all of our witness. It's in everything we say and everything we do. Whatever's written on our forehead, so to speak. Whatever's written on our right hand. And this is what we're supposed to be, is representatives for our king, servants, slaves for our king. We're supposed to bring him glory and honor. We didn't do that. And sin doesn't go without consequence. Shemot chapter 32 again, starting in verse 26. And Moshe stood in the entrance of the camp and said, Whoever is on Yahweh's side, come to me. And the sons of Levi gathered themselves together, chose Yahweh, and came to him. And he said unto them, Thus says Yahweh, Elohim of Israel, Let every man who pledges allegiance to Yahweh, who is loyal to Yahweh, and not man, put his sword on his side, and go in and out from entrance to entrance throughout the camp, and let every man kill his brother and every man his companion, and every man his neighbor, according to the flesh, who was involved in worshiping the calves. Okay, Show me that you value me more than you value your own flesh and blood. Just like your ancestor Avraham had to show me that he valued me more than he valued his own flesh and blood. You show me the same thing. Verse 28. So the sons of Levi did according to the word of Moshe. And about 3,000 men of the people fell that day. Talk about frontier justice. Moshe talks Yahweh out of wiping the people out. And then he goes and handles, takes care of the problem. So in the great national failure of the golden calf, each of our forefathers was asked to choose. Was he on Yahweh's side or not? Well, astonishingly, only the Levites chose Yahweh. Just them, only the Levites. And there were 3,000 men who were showing allegiance not to Yahweh, but to Satan. They weren't obeying his commandments, and they lost their lives. So why should it be any different with us, brothers and sisters? Let's consider the golden calf rule. Let us not do unto Yahweh our Elohim as our ancestors did unto him. Because if Yahweh was ready to consume our ancestors in a moment for not obeying him, has Yahweh changed? What? Oh, 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 I see. So do we think Yeshua came to give us a way out of obeying his father in building his kingdom? Yeshua came so we didn't have to do that, right? He came to make the Great Commission optional, right? So Yahweh sent his son Yeshua to die an excruciating death to let us out of building the kingdom. Is that it? Oh, oh, but what? Okay, so so Yahweh the Father was outraged with our ancestors for ignoring his voice and for not keeping his commandments, but that was then and this is now. So he's not going to hold us accountable in the same way for not obeying his son's instructions, right? Because we're special, right? Because we have Yeshua and we say we keep Torah when really we're not keeping Torah, we're not hastening to keep all of his commandments. Oh, we're just doing the ones we like, right? We're resting and we're reading, and that's keeping Torah. 
is resting and reading. Resting and reading builds the kingdom. I see. Okay. And no hypocrisy there at all. Brothers, where is our allegiance to our king? Now, like it or not, whether we realize it or not, we are in a spiritual war. We were born into it. It pre-existed us. And we're in this mess precisely because we have not listened for Yahweh's voice and done everything he said. All the way back to the Garden of Eden, just like our forefathers in coming out of Egypt, something deep in our hearts wants to believe we don't need to listen attentively for Yahweh's voice 24-7 because we don't need to. He's not, he's not trying to communicate anything valuable or important by his spirit now. No, uh, everything that was communicated that was valuable, that was back in the first century. Yeah, no, we don't actually have to hasten to do everything Scripture says, right? Because we're not, we're not accountable for all of Scripture, right? I mean, that's why it's given to us in written format is because we're not accountable to it, right? It's nice if we want to read it, that's okay. It's good to, to read it, right? But we don't, we don't have to read it, right? Right? Because now we have Yeshua's spirit. So that's why we don't need to do what Yeshua said. It's because we have his spirit, right? <laughs> you know, I mean... I don't know anyone who talks like that, but I know a whole lot of messianics that that's pretty much what they say. That's pretty much what they communicate like, you know, and and the reason why is because we just seem to have something more important to do than hearing his voice and doing what he says, (laughs) you know, and one day, perhaps, maybe, we can all wake up one day and we can realize not only are we in Yahweh's army, but there's a spiritual war on. We need to find something to do. So Yeshua has given us a Melchizedekian framework called the Melchizedekian order where we can learn to plug ourselves into. We talk about that in Acts 15 order and Torah government and other studies. But Brothers, if we know the Torah is still for today, then do we talk with Yahweh? Do we ask him to show us what's important about his word? And more importantly, do we find out what he wants? What are the things he's going for? And then once we know what he wants us to do, do we hasten to do it? Are we diligent to do everything that he says to do because we know he's a king and we love him and we want to make him happy? Or are we perhaps like King Shaul or perhaps like our ancestors, basically choosing disobedience, whether through laziness or idleness or some other means? Well, you know, if we have a king and if we love our king and if we want to serve him with all of our hearts, with all of our soul and with all of our strength. And let's just say one day we wake up and we're all alone. Let's say the new world order has shut down Nazarene Israel ministry because we perhaps don't agree with the United Religions initiative, this kind of a thing. And so suddenly, brother, sister, you know, if let's say you find yourself all alone with no more Nazarene Israel channel, uh, no more Moshe to guide you, so to speak, what would you do? Would you seek a deep relationship with Yeshua to deepen that relationship and strengthen as much as you could? Or would we choose not to do much of anything really because it's cheaper and easier to get together at a friend's house and do the things that we like to do as opposed to actually taking care that we follow and do everything that's written in Scripture because we're accountable for the whole document. So, 
do we set up a golden calf called the messianic movement, perhaps, where we say, oh, well, mysteriously, mystery Babylon, mysteriously, we don't need to obey Yeshua's commandments. We don't need to organize according to the fivefold ministry. We don't need to unify on a single foundation of apostles and prophets, like Ephesians 2 says. No, you know, Yeshua died to set us free from all that, right? So, you know, just bumbling along like one of our ancestors in the wilderness, that's going to be enough to get us through the judgment, right? Because, you know, we don't actually need to, like, you know, obey Yeshua's commandments, either in the Renewed Covenant or when he was giving our forefathers the Torah coming out of Mitzrayim. We don't have to obey either one of those two things, right? Because we have Yeshua, so we don't need to obey Yeshua, right? <laughs> you know, brothers, sisters, Babylon is a demon. It's a bad one. It's an insidious demon. And if you... <laughs> we can't take Satan on in our flesh. Satan is stronger than we are. We need Yeshua working in us, not just some false belief on Yeshua. We need a constant 24-7 connection with Yeshua. We need listening and if we don't hear, pray for it. Ask, seek, knock. We need to ask Elohim for help in rooting Babylon out of our heart, or it won't go. We have to flee Babylon. But if we don't flee it, we don't try to root it out, it won't go. You know, and mystery Babylon is a means of pretending to obey Yahweh while not actually obeying Yahweh. We don't do that here. Okay, Acts 15, we don't do that with the rabbis. We also don't do that with the messianics. Uh, you know, we don't want to pretend to obey Yahweh in anything. Uh, that's just not... That's what got our forefathers in trouble leaving Egypt. So, you know, if we're going to... If we're going to call ourselves Nazarenes, then effectively we should do what the ringleader of the sect of the Nazarenes in the first century, Shaliach Shaul, the Apostle Paul, commanded in Quarantine Bet or 2 Corinthians chapter 13 and verse 5. Now, Shaul told us, exhorted us, we should examine ourselves and check if we believe that this is important and if we believe that Yahweh is truly in charge then we should examine ourselves and see whether we're truly walking in the Spirit or are we perhaps still walking after the flesh even though we're claiming Yahweh's and Yeshua's name? Shouldn't we examine ourselves to make sure that we're truly in the faith once delivered to the saints? Shouldn't we test ourselves like King David says in the Psalms? do we perhaps not yet realize that when we say we are Yeshua's and that Yeshua Messiah dwells in us, that that means that we're submitting every day. We're inviting the Spirit in. We wake up in the morning. That's the first thing we should do. So make sure to establish that connection. Then we're ready to begin. But we have to submit ourselves to Him. There's no way to be his bride, to be his servant, to be his slave, to be a soldier. How can you serve anyone if you don't submit to them? So we need, we need to submit first to him and then one to another in him. And then we need to let the Spirit be our guide and lead us and guide us 24-7 after that. But the thing is, if that's not the case, we're not walking the right way, meaning we're walking more like our forefathers in the wilderness. And that means that we would be lukewarm. And that means that we would become disqualified. Brother, sister, uh, if you're home, take a look around your house. If you're not home, when you get home, take a look around your house. Now, is everything there in your house there because that's what you need to lead your family to serve Yahweh? Or is it there for other reasons, perhaps? 
How much of our life is set apart and dedicated to our king? How much, what percentage of our life do we have dedicated to fighting his fight? All? Or something less than all? You know, our king has a cause. He has a fight, and he calls us to fight it for him. That's what the parable of the mean is all about. In order to fight his fight effectively, we have to die to our old life in the world. Like when you join the army or the military, you have to lay down your life as a civilian in the world. He calls us to this fight for him. And he doesn't push anything. He wants to see what we will do for him when we have all the time that we can either choose to respond to him or not choose to respond to him. He's not going to make us do anything, but to not respond to him, he sees that like a form of treason. He died that we might leave Satan's kingdom in Egypt. He died so that we might no longer have to work for Paro or Pharaoh or Babylon. <clears throat> but now he wants us to live for him. What, what, what human king wouldn't call it treason if he died so his subjects could live for him and they didn't do it? That's what treason, you know, that's dereliction of duty, gross dereliction of duty at the least. <laughs> you know, I mean, do we, do we understand what it means for us to follow the same patterns as our forefathers, and especially to follow the same patterns as our forefathers and think we're doing it so much better than they did? Do, do we ever stop to look at our lives the way that Yahweh is going to look at our lives in the day of judgment? And do we ever stop to take a look around our house? Do we take a look at our calendar? Do we take a look at our checkbook? You know, these are the things that define where we spend our money and our time. You know, our time and our money, those are our two most scarce, precious, two most valuable resources in this world. So here's the question. Do we spend our most precious resources on us? Or do we perhaps spend our precious resources on him and on building his son's kingdom? Where is our allegiance? Are we allegiant to ourselves, loyal to ourselves? Yeah, I think most people are allegiant to themselves, particularly under democracy. We'll talk about democracy some other place, but democracy is a sort of a power-sharing strategy among men who see themselves effectively as sovereigns. It's a very, very red horse attitude. Oh, and so they, they come up with a strategy for sharing power. We'll talk about that, Father willing, <clears throat> some other time. But are, you know, are we allegiant to ourselves or to our democracy, to our government, to our way of life? Or are we allegiant to Yahweh and his son? We pledge allegiance, is it to a flag? We pledge allegiance to Yahweh Elohim. You know, brothers, are we perhaps unwittingly breaking the golden calf rule? Do we have golden calves in our lives? Anything, just something that comes in between us and seeking Yahweh with all of our hearts, with all of our soul, with all of our strength. You know, not many people even really listen for Yahweh's voice. Fewer still seek him. A few will listen for what Yahweh says. How few seek his heart how few want to know what he likes so they can walk that way. King David did, Shaul did, all the prophets did. Brothers, are we perhaps behaving like our forefathers did when they left Egypt, even though we don't even know it? <clears throat> are we perhaps forgetting the need to listen attentively to his voice every day, 24-7, and to do 
what he says diligently when we hear him speak it? Are we living sacrificial lives for him? Are we following a narrow and afflicted path? Or are we perhaps like great big babies, depending on him carrying us? You know, uh, I guarantee Yeshua wasn't seeking his own will when he was hanging there on the cross or the tree or the stake or whatever you want to call it. I mean, he wasn't ordering takeout. Uh, he wasn't worried about how his kids are going to get along and mesh with the secular world and play t-ball on the sports teams. <clears throat> you know, when he was in agony on the cross or the stake or whatever you want to call it, he was there paying for us. And if we ever forget that, if we ever forget that we are owned, if we ever forget that we, it's required of us, to remain in connection. Uh, you know, the, the deal is we get to keep our lives, but we don't get to live our lives. How many of us still want to live our lives instead of dying to ourselves, dying to our wants, being spiritually transformed, and then living from then on unto Him? If we know what our commander-in-chief wants, are we allegiant to our commander-in-chief? Are we allegiant to our king who already died for us? His loyalty is proven. So what about our loyalty? Are we obeying his call to build him a kingdom according to all of his rules? Or are we perhaps like our forefathers, lukewarm and going to be vomited out, never make it back home to the land? You know, brothers and sisters, Yeshua didn't go to his death so we can go on vacation. Yeshua didn't go to his death so we can live nice, happy lives. Yeshua didn't suffer on the tree so that we could sit on our thrones and he could continue to wash our feet. And we sit there and do nothing, give nothing back to him. You know, Yeshua healed 10 lepers. Only one came back even to give thanks. He didn't ask Yeshua, what can I do for you, Master? He just came back to give thanks. And even that was only one out of 10. So we know from Scripture, this is, this is the standard thing. You get the 4,000 and the 5,000 and the myriads and the multitudes and the crowds and the throngs. And they come through and they never stop to ask, what can I do for you, master? Oh, keep your commandments. Yes, my king, happy to. Let me, let me hasten to keep your commandments. You know, Yeshua, he knows what the standard is. There have been good servants in the past. The question is, are we living, willing to live up to these high standards? What are we doing with the rope he's feeding us? Are we building a big net to become fishers of men, or are we just basically getting ready to hang ourselves? What are we doing with the mina of our saved life? What are we doing with the time he gives us? How much of our free time is dedicated to Yahweh? Or how much of our free time, our free time, are we spending keeping up with the Joneses, so to speak? Now, what, what are we doing, brothers? Are we going to spend our time and our money on us and what we want and what we like when we love him with all we have? Or are we going to spend what we have on him? Because we love him. What else will we do with our money? What else will we do with our time? He is our hobby. We will be love serving him. So... You, 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 you can't love him and not want to serve him. It doesn't work. If we're not obeying his command, as he says, if you love me, then keep my commandments. If we, he means all of his commandments. If we don't keep all of his commandments, 
according to his words, then we don't love him. So knowing these things, why does it seem like so many of us in Ephraim just seem like we've got a death grip on ignorance? We're just sort of dead set on playing silly little games with our eternal salvation, just like our forefathers did in the wilderness coming out of Egypt. And they don't even know it, just like our forefathers in the wilderness didn't know it. They thought they were doing just fine. You know, <laughs> but did things change? Did Yahweh change? Yeshua didn't die so that we in Ephraim can enjoy an easy life and ask Yahweh to provide a nice vacation for us every year. That's not what building his kingdom means. Like any king, Yeshua requires 100% commitment, total devotion. He's not going to accept anything less than that. Yeshua tells us in the parable of the Minas, one day he's going to return, and in that day he's going to require an account of what his servants did for him with their Minas or their saved lives. And if the answer is not much, it's not going to go well, brethren. If the servant didn't do his utmost to serve his master, then according to Hebrew thinking, that's a wicked, bad, evil servant, and he ends up dead. He ends up cut into pieces and being cast into the outer darkness where there's weeping and gnashing of teeth. These are Yeshua's words. This is the situation we find ourselves in. Yeshua feeds us all the rope we need instead of choosing to serve Yeshua with it by plugging ourselves, by using our time, by using our saved life to plug ourselves into Yeshua's Melchizedekian framework, we can serve Yeshua that way. If we don't want to plug into Yeshua's Melchizedekian framework, knowing that he's our king, but we don't want to do what his word says to do, Rebellion is as the sin of self-idolatry. Ephraim is like one who looks at his face in the mirror and then immediately he goes away and forgets what kind of man he was. He forgets. He knows one time he was loyal to Yeshua. One time he sat at Yeshua's feet and just looked up and was in awe and wonder and just felt wretched. Didn't, couldn't even, didn't even want to look at him but he goes away and forgets that. There's times he feels connected to Yeshua, but he doesn't maintain it 24-7. He goes away and forgets what kind of man he was. He may have repented once in his life a long time ago, but the problem is he's not walking in repentance. If he was walking in repentance, he'd already be walking the same faith as what Yeshua taught because that's his will for us. <laughs> Ephraim, wake up. How do you solve a problem like Ephraim? You know, if our family life is about enjoying our lives in the world, about singing and dancing, going to movies, keeping up with the Joneses, having a, a good old time, but we don't care. We're gone hunting and fishing and camping and going to the museums. The children have friends in the world. We don't care what Yeshua, who will return as the conquering king, the lion of the tribe of Judah, we don't care about obeying what Yeshua wants for us to be doing for him right now? Really? Actions don't lie. Words can lie. Actions don't lie. So if we're not doing what Yeshua says he wants us to be doing right now, we had better watch out, brothers, sisters.
because our ancestors were all eating and drinking, marrying and giving in marriage in Noah's day, before they were all destroyed. And our ancestors in the wilderness, they were feasting and dancing and enjoying everything all around, having a good old time with the golden calf before they were all destroyed. Yahweh's not kidding when he says the wages for sin is death. That doesn't change just because we profess belief on Yeshua and that we don't want to live according to his spirit. Yeah, I mean, look, come on, figure it out. We married into the family of a war Elohim. Hello? He's a war Elohim. He's not only like a modern-day general, you know, in a modern day warfare, the general's wife never goes to the battlefront. Okay. He's an ancient style battlefield king. And wives in his family need to be able to take orders along with the best of them. You know, some young bride wants to marry his son. Good. Does she want to learn how to listen for his voice and diligently do everything that he says to do? good. And if not, you know, brothers, we are responsible for everything in scripture. We're responsible for every word Yahweh Elohim has spoken. And we're responsible to live in accordance with these words. So knowing that, are we doing that? Or are we effectively playing games with our eternal salvation? You know, do we not think Yahweh is going to hold us just as accountable as our ancestors? Oh, no, right, no. I mean, Yahweh sent his son to die so that we don't have to obey him, right? Knock, knock, knock. Is that from body home? Yeshua died so that we wouldn't have to be allegiant to Yahweh and we wouldn't have to obey all his words? Is that what we think? Yeshua came to die so that we would be allegiant to Yahweh and so that we would begin to obey all his words yet again. Yeshua didn't come to die so that we can pick and choose which parts of his Torah we want to keep. Oh, and then have the audacity to call it keeping Torah, just like our ancestors did back in the garden, and just like at the time of the golden calf. And again, with the golden calf in the days of Jeroboam. Oh, and let's not forget King Shaul. Well, okay, brothers, what is our golden calf now, today? that we don't want to hear Yahweh's voice and obey him. Do what he says and do all that's written. What is it that we don't want to have this relationship with him? This obedience, love relationship of father to child, of husband to wife. What is it we don't want about that? We love him so much, but we don't want this kind of relationship. No, but we love him with all of our heart. <laughs> you know, our actions don't lie. Actions speak louder than words. Our forefathers loved the idea of leaving Egypt and going to Yahweh's land, no longer being in slavery. Great. Oh, but then there was work involved. And there was difficulty involved. And eventually, there was war involved in all the difficulties that come with war. And the war Elohim's newly betrothed bride apparently wasn't up for it back then. Nope, sorry, ride got too rough. Nope, we don't need to obey Yahweh anymore. But we're still married, right? Wedding's still on, even though I'm not going to obey the wedding contract, right? It's all good. <laughs> Brother. Ephraim, hello, wake up. Can we understand that kings demand allegiance? And they reward those who look out for their best interests. They, they 
do good things for them. You know, if you have a servant who's using his mina to serve you and help increase your kingdom, you want to take good care of that servant. But if you have a lazy servant, neglecting his duties, could be helping you in your kingdom, is not really. Isn't that like the lazy servant lays up his meaning in a handkerchief or puts in a box somewhere in a drawer? Yahweh considers that as a minimum. That's considered extreme dereliction of duty. But more likely, he considers it rebellion, which is as the sin of witchcraft. Because we knew what Yahweh our Elohim wanted us to do, we didn't hasten to do it. It's called rebellion. It's called treason to disobey the king's command. And the sentence for rebellion is death. And not always in a nice way. And let's not think that Yeshua's blood covers us for rebellion against Elohim after we say we already converted and joined his team. Okay, that just makes no sense. We're going to join his team, but we don't have to take orders or be loyal after we joined his team. Because he sent his son to die so that we would join his team. And so now that we join his team, we get to pick and choose which of his commandments we want to keep. Because we're the king secretly, not him. That's the attitude. Wow. And that's not as the sin of witchcraft. Placing ourselves above Elohim. What do we think we're doing? But look at the way we treat him. We're just going to let ourselves into our king's kitchen. We're going to eat all his spiritual food. We're going to rest and lounge in his house. Oh, and then we don't want to work. We don't want to actually do any So we've We've eaten all the food, we've rested, we've relaxed, we've been educated, and we don't want to do anything for him. Oh, and we also don't want to pay any taxes. Okay, how long is, how's that kingdom going to work? Okay, and if, if that is not our concern, is to make our king's kingdom work, why is it that we pray and we ask, that Yeshua tells us to pray that the Father's kingdom come? that his will may be done on earth as it is in heaven. Do we understand that we are the hands and feet that are going to walk that out? We have to start with our obedience to his voice. We have to abide in him and him in us, him and the Father and the Father with him, in him, to restore that lost and broken connection. Then things become possible. You know, in these last days, those who remain allegiant to Egypt, they're going to suffer the plagues of Egypt. Those who ally themselves with Babylon are going to suffer the plagues of Babylon. Kid Galut or Revelation chapter 18 and verse 4 says to come out of the Babylonian system. In addition, also to come out of the land of Babylon, which we show in the Revelation study, is the United States of America. Because if we don't come out of the world, if we don't come out of Egypt, we don't come out of the sins of the world and the sins of Babylon, we will be called to account for our sins in these last days. Brothers and sisters, Ephraim, please, please, please pay attention to this. We already know from prophecy, most of Ephraim is not going to make it home. If you're listening to this video or listening to audio, please take this seriously. And verse 8 tells us not to be fooled because the judgment is delayed in coming. It says Babylon's plagues are going to come in one day. Death, mourning, famine, and she will be utterly burned with fire. For strong is Yahweh Elohim who judges her. Now, our Haftar prophetic portion covers many of the same themes. It begins in Yehezkel, or Ezekiel, chapter 36, starting in verse 16. Here, 
Yahweh speaks about what he will bring to pass with his children, Israel, in the latter days. And we read that even after all of our forefathers' unfaithfulness to him, after everything we have done, after all of our falling away, breaking faith, breaking covenant, he still promises to protect those of us who show allegiance to him. He will bring his loyal and faithful ones back home. That's the safest place to be. Yechezkel chapter 36 tells us some pretty amazing things. In verse 24, Yahweh says he will bring Israel or Ephraim back home. Woohoo! All right. Score one. Good. Verse 28, he says that Israel will be his people again. Yes. Score two. However, brothers, sisters, if we read the entire chapter, we should be easily able to see that Yahweh is really not too happy with us. We might think we're doing great. We might think we're keeping Torah. Uh, but have we really truly followed Yeshua's spirit? Yahweh says we are right now filthy with idols. and This is causing his great name to be profaned. We're refusing to organize. We don't want to organize. It's too hard. It's too difficult. It takes too much money. It takes too much time. We don't want to do that. That's causing his great name to be profaned, and that's why. It's only because of his mercy and only because of his namesake. He's going to cleanse us and then bring us back home. Because we just never really got things out of first gear, brothers. We just never really made up our minds to serve Yahweh first out of love. We never really decided to seek ye first the kingdom of heaven. Then everything we need to serve him will be added unto us. Verse 17. He says, Son of man, when the house of Israel, or the house of Ephraim, dwelt in their own land, They defiled it by doing things their own way. They didn't do things my way. They wanted to do things their way. But to me, their way was like the uncleanness of a woman in her customary impurity. Can't use it for anything. Doesn't build my son's ordered kingdom the way I need it to be built. They're doing things their own way. They're not doing things my way. I can't use that. And I look upon that like rebellion, because that's what it is. He says, therefore, I poured out my fury on them for the blood they had shed on the land and for their idols with which they had defiled it. And then I scattered our forefathers, the house of Ephraim, out among the nations and with some of the southern kingdom that sojourns with them. And I dispersed them throughout all the countries, and I judged them according to their ways and according to their deeds. Verse 20, when they came to the nations, wherever they went, they profaned my set-apart name, because they didn't do what I said. They called themselves by my name, but they're not obeying me. So the nations said to them, these are the dedicated set-apart people of Yahweh. This is his bride who professed Love for him publicly at Mount Sinai. (laughs) Now look, he's kicked his bride out of his house because she's disobedient to him. (laughs) Who needs to obey Yahweh? He can't even get his own bride, Ephraim, to obey him. What do we need to respect him for? He can't even get his own bride to respect him. Brothers, All through our history, we in Ephraim have rejected Yahweh's statutes and his commandments. We haven't been loyal. We haven't shown allegiance. What makes us think that we're loyal? What makes us think that we're allegiant when we're not hastening to keep all of his commandments? Yahweh tells us to be confounded and ashamed because of our ways and our behavior. So, hmm, let's think about this dispassionately. 
are we in Ephraim genuinely as pleasing to Yahweh as we might like to believe? Or who's he talking about right here in this passage? Here, who, who's not hastening to show his allegiance by, by doing everything Yahweh says as soon as he hears it? Who is that? Well, some good news of the kingdom is that Yahweh says he will put his spirit in us. We know we don't have his spirit if we're not hastening to keep all of his commandments. But he'll give his spirit. He'll put it in us. And that is going to cause us to walk in his statutes and to guard his judgments and do them. But again, brethren, that is for the few allegiant ones who at least are doing enough to survive the tribulation that's coming. They may not know everything, but they're being allegiant and faithful to what they know. You know, let's just be frank. The survival rate for what's coming is going to be very, very low. And if we don't walk right, we're not going to make it. And when our forefathers were leaving Egypt, most of them didn't make it. So if there was ever a time to be right, it, we're, it doesn't really matter when we live in history. Because sooner or later, we're all going to go stand in the judgment and answer for what we did and answer for what we didn't do. But when we're looking the tribulation in the face, and we see what's coming, and we can read how bad it's going to get, and we say, the safest place to be is in Yahweh's will. Where is Yahweh's will? Except doing the things he told his, Yeshua to, his son Yeshua to do, which is to build him a kingdom. You know, the difference is this time, if our children don't walk right, they won't make it in either because this time no one who is impure will be allowed to enter the land does that sound hard what excuses do we have we serve a war elohim we've had his son's spirit for two thousand years now so do we mean in two thousand years as the bride of the son of the war Elohim, we still don't really know what kind of obedience our commander and king wants. Really? 2,000 years with Yeshua's spirit and we as the bride, we still don't know what our husband wants. Really? Or is it, is it we don't listen for our commander and king's radio transmissions? So of course we don't hear what he says. So, of course, we don't obey the radio transmissions because we didn't realize we're supposed to be listening for them. We thought it was enough just to read about what happened with our ancestors in the wilderness. We we're just taking turns reading things. Not like there's any lessons have to be applied to us. <laughs> you know? Um, I don't know, but I just think if Yahweh thinks about the Torah portions, I, I just wonder, does he ever say, you know, I wonder, are they going to read it with an eye to see what their ancestors did wrong so they can learn from the mistakes of history and know how to apply them to themselves? Because all our forefathers, their bones all dropped in the wilderness. Verse 22. Therefore say to the house of Israel, the house of Ephraim, thus says Yahweh Elohim, I do not do this for your sake, O house of Israel, because I've already given you countless chances and you've ignored all of them. It's, it's like you're completely incorrigible. So I'm not doing this for your sake because we've already been down that road a thousand times. Therefore, rather, I'm doing this for my set-apart namesake, even though you've already profaned it among the nations wherever you went spreading Torahlessness everywhere in my name. And the people all laugh at me because of how my son's bride is misbehaving and flouting 
He's taking all the benefits, doesn't want to do anything for the kingdom. Therefore, I'll set my great name apart, which has been profaned among the nations, which you have profaned in their midst. And then the nations shall know that I am Yahweh, says Yahweh, but I am set apart before you in their eyes. Ephraim, you're going to realize how important it is to obey me. You're either going to learn that or you're not going to survive the tribulation. But those of you that want to please me, those of you that want to survive, those of you that want to raise your children up in the way they should go so that when they're older, they shall not depart from it and they'll make it into the kingdom. You will know that I am Yahweh. You will know how important it is to obey my voice, to do the things I tell you to do. I'm trying to help you succeed but you've got to listen for me. You've got to do the things I tell you to do, verse 24. And that's when I'm going to take you from among all the nations, and I'm going to gather you out of all the countries after trumpet seven, after the tribulation, and I'm going to bring you into your own ancient homeland after Armageddon, verse 25. That's when I'm going to sprinkle clean water on you and you shall finally, ultimately be clean. I'm going to cleanse you from all of your filth, all from your, all of your idols. I'm going to give you a new heart. I'm going to put a new spirit within you. I'm going to take the heart of stone out of your flesh. We thought we had a fleshly heart right now. Apparently, it's a heart of stone. He's going to take this stony heart out of our flesh. He's going to give us a heart of flesh. It's going to be like being born again all over again. Verse 27, he says, And I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you will keep my judgments and do them at long last. Then, once you start obeying, once you have the right spirit, once you begin obeying, that's when you shall dwell in the land which I gave to your fathers. And that's when you shall be my people. And then I will be your Elohim. When our allegiance to him changes, when we switch sides, we turn away from Satan and the kingdom of Egypt and Babylon. We turn back to Yahweh who made us. And he knows when we love him, when we're eager to do everything he says because then we trust him. We know we're doing these things because Yahweh has commanded us these things for our own good. Well, if you were to ask the average Christian or Messianic or Ephraimite how he thinks his walk in Elohim is, he'd probably tell you he's doing good. He's a, he's a disciple and he's doing a good job. He's doing a great job. He could do a little better, but mostly he's doing a good job. And he'd probably say that He does love Yahweh as Elohim with all of his heart, with all of his soul, and with all of his strength. But the thing is, is he really doing anything? Is he lifting a finger to truly build Yeshua's unified global kingdom according to all Yeshua's instructions? Or most Ephraimites, most Messianics, is their idea of discipleship sitting and relaxing in front of the TV set or going out to movies with family and friends, going to dinner, having closeness and oneness with the world. They want their children to merge, to mesh well at school. Their their idea of serving Yahweh is not to be a people set apart unto him. But maybe they might want to post some verses on Facebook or some social media. They might want to get together on Shabbat and break bread and sing a few songs together, maybe a little messianic dance. All right. Well, you know, when we read the parasha, Yahweh tells us that our view of ourselves in these last days, somehow, is not the same as his view of our performance and behavior in these last days. In Yechezkel or Ezekiel chapter 30, starting in verse 31, Yahweh tells us, The times are coming very soon. 
We will remember our evil ways in our past and our deeds that were not good. And that's when we're going to have true repentance. We're going to loathe ourselves in our own sight for our iniquities and for our repeated patterns of sin, for all our lukewarmness and our abominations. Verse 32, he says, not for our sake is he going to do this. We need to acknowledge this. This is what he wants. He wants us to acknowledge the existence of sin in our lives. Not just that we have sin, but that our nature is sinful. And that we have to learn to be ashamed and confounded for our ways, O house of Ephraim. Because we have rebelled continuously against the ways of Yahweh our Elohim. Well, are we ashamed and confounded over our sins yet? Are we repenting and turning back to Yahweh yet? The reason we ask is because for our Brit Hadashah portions, we're going to talk about what Ephraim can do in order to become a people pleasing to Yahweh again. And therefore, if we're pleasing to him, we can escape his righteous judgments that are going to come upon the whole earth. So like it or not, there's still some things that we in Ephraim need to learn as a people. For one thing, we are all called to learn how to hear his voice and to obey what it says diligently. Uh, So hearing his voice, that includes obeying his written commandments as well. It's it's not an option. It's not, uh, well, we're doing okay now, but one day maybe we're going to tithe. Maybe one day we're going to obey congregational discipline. Maybe one day that's not how it is. That might be how it is in the church. That's not how it is in Scripture. So, another thing that we need to learn in the house of Ephraim is we need to be doers of his word and not just hearers only, like our ancestors deceiving ourselves. That's what our ancestors did. That's what the church wants still, is that we deceive ourselves. And forgive me, that's what the rabbis want also. They're part of the Babylonian system. Now in Matthew, Yahu, or Matthew chapter 9, starting in verse 35, Yeshua speaks to his disciples about how large the harvest is and how few laborers there are. We understand this in Nazarene Israel. And he says that his disciples should pray to Yahweh to send out laborers into his harvest. Verse 35. Then Yeshua went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion for them, because they were weary and scattered, like sheep having no shepherd. And he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, Pray the master of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. The only question is, why aren't there more true laborers working in his harvest? Because if we're walking the right way, we're already promised. It's not going to be easy. Yeshua tells us it's a narrow and afflicted path that we seek. It has persecution. and It costs money. Uh, The kingdom runs on our sacrifices, on our donations. So anytime you really serve Yahweh, you're giving. It's paid to play, so to speak. Well, the reason there aren't more true workers, the sad truth, is that most of us are interested only in what we can get from Yahweh. We approach Yahweh like a thing of the world. In the world... You want to see how much can you get for how little. That's the basic law of supply and demand and this kind of a thing. But to treat Yahweh that way, to treat Yahweh like a thing of the world, we're trying to get as much from Yahweh as we can, trying to see how little we can give back to him. Yahweh is not mocked. 
you know, when we start talking about how a man will reap even as he sows, now let's start talking about our walks. Now let's start talking about how do we show Yahweh allegiance? How do we honor Yahweh? How do we glorify his name? That's going to cost us something to glorify his name. That's not going to be a free walk. So the number of people who are willing to participate in the worship when it's free is this much. And the number who are willing to pay the cost, the true cost, drops way down once they hear sacrifices involved. And that's how Yahweh knows the difference, because only those who truly love him enough first to learn what he wants and then to do it, to implement it in his life so that everything that he does is in line with Yahweh's priorities for our lives. We have to lay down our lives and our priorities for our lives. We have to pick up our burden. We have to begin living for him in a very real way. We need to begin living to build his kingdom. And the numbers drop way down because Yahweh doesn't like lip service. No matter how much we claim to believe in Yeshua, and no matter how much we claim to be his followers, you know, no matter how much we claim to be his people, he is not impressed when we pick and choose which of his commandments we want to keep. You know, and he's, he's not impressed with that. Well, a very important study that everyone needs to know about is in the Torah calendar study. Near the end, it's called About Service. Most people have no idea what service means to Yahweh. Most Christians, you say, well, that's not what that means to me. It's like, it doesn't matter what it means to us. It matters what it means to Yahweh. So in the Torah calendar study, in this chapter on about service, we talk about how Yahweh views service. And we never stop to think about it. But in scripture, service is effectively anything we pay attention to. If we're giving our attention to something, we are serving something. If we're paying attention to Yahweh, then effectively we might be serving Yahweh if we're doing what he says. If we pay attention to Yeshua, we might be serving Yeshua if we're doing what he says diligently because we're eager to do so, because we love him. We want to see his kingdom built. We're going to be ruling and reigning it over it after all. Well, if we uh, obey the rabbis, then effectively we're serving the rabbis. Elohim forbid. If we obey the Pope's words, then we're effectively serving the Pope. Elohim forbid. Uh, if we in Ephraim adore a golden calf or a cross or a hexagram or a hexagram fish, we're basically paying attention to or serving those images and the spirits that are attached to them. Elohim forbid. And for those who want to know about the images, we have a study called Forbidden Images or about Forbidden Images. I believe it's in Nazarene Scripture Studies Volume 1. If it's not in 1, it's in 2. But Forbidden Images, you can do a search for it. The thing is, when we pay attention to these visible objects, these graven images, if you will, these visible objects, these eye dolls, they are receiving our energies and attentions. So therefore, why are we doing that? Elohim says we're serving them. Elohim forbid, but that's what he says. So to give attention to anything is to serve that thing. So now Yahweh, let's take this to the fullest extension. Yahweh tells us that he is a jealous Elohim and that his name means jealous. And what is Yahweh jealous of but his wife's attentions and his wife's loyalty and his wife's allegiance? You know, the thing is, we only have so much time in this world how much of it are we spending with Elohim? 
you know, if we don't want to spend time with Elohim now, how does he know we will want to spend time with him in eternal life? If someone doesn't want to spend an hour or two with you once a week, are you going to want to spend forever with them? I don't think so. So how does Yahweh feel when we are more interested to go to the movies or to go to the bookstore or to go to the mall than we are to spend time in his word? How does Yahweh feel when we're more excited to go to dinner than we are to stay in his word? so we can know how to be of use to help his son build his kingdom. In Devarim, or Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 13, Yahweh tells us that we are to fear Yahweh our Elohim and serve him only. We're to take oaths in his name if we take oaths, but we're to serve him only. Brothers and sisters, if we give our attentions to the movies, We give our attentions to t-ball, basketball, track and field, vacations, prosperity doctrine, the things of this world. We are not behaving like loyal and allegiant soldiers of our king. And if we don't behave like loyal and allegiant soldiers, how will he know that we're loyal to him? In 2 Timothy chapter 4, we see the time is going to come when we Ephraimites will not endure sound teachings based on Yahweh's word. Instead, our people, us, we're going to flock to whatever teacher or preacher tells us what we want to hear, tickles our ears according to our desires. In other words, we don't want to know what Yahweh says. We want someone to tell us what we want to hear, and dress it up like it's the word of Yahweh. That's just what we saw in the Haftar prophetic portion. Verse 3 tells us that the time will come when our people will not endure sound doctrine. Sound like today? But rather, according to our desires, because we have itching ears, we heap up teachers for ourselves. We go, Round up some dumb, greedy dogs that don't know how to bark. You know, and it's the house of Ephraim. That's what we do. We turn away from Yahweh's truth. We turn away from the Torah. We're turned aside unto fables again and again. You know, brothers, Mystery Babylon is all about appearing to worship Elohim correctly when we're not really. It's about putting on a facade. It's a show. It's not the real thing. And the thing is, in the Christian world, and even to some extent in the Messianic world, and in the Ephraimite world, they're all about adoring Yeshua. So we adore Yeshua. But when in the church do we ever learn to walk like Yeshua? You know, and who among us doesn't need to learn to walk like Yeshua, become more like Yeshua before we can realistically build a unified global kingdom for him. And that's the task that his father sent him to establish. And he, in the parable of the Minas, tells us that it's our job to build the kingdom while he's off receiving the kingdom and then will return. It's our job to be building it for him now. It's a very different structure than the church. You know, if we're willing to receive it, the church is kind of like the ancient Roman amphitheater system. The people pay their money, they file in, they're entertained, and now they leave. Did anyone learn how to walk like Yeshua walked? Or did it just sort of look like worship of Elohim and service to Elohim even though it wasn't really what he says to do in his word. (laughs) And can we understand why Elohim would have a problem with that? What's Yahweh's problem with that anyway? We didn't, not even doing what his book says to do. What's his problem with that? You know, oh, 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 but we expect to be taken as part of his bride, right? Even though we're not doing what his book says to do, right? (laughs) Brothers, 
what it really comes down to, forgive me for being so bold, but what it really comes down to is that each one of us must make a very personal decision. Each one of us has to take the time to sit down and count the cost and ask ourselves, do we want to learn to serve our king the way he says he wants to be served? Or do we want to be one of the many that fall dead in the tribulation, in the wilderness, still outside the land, just like our forefathers fell dead when they were leaving Egypt because they didn't want to hear and they didn't want to be zealous to do? Well, brothers, when our people are scattered, when they're doing the wrong things, do we want to be like them? Or do we choose to become like the faithful Levites who chose Yahweh? And they went down in history for choosing to be on Yahweh's side, for taking up his cause. Isn't that what we're supposed to do for Yeshua? Is to choose to be on his side, to take up his cause. Brothers and sisters, do we show allegiance to our king? Are we showing him some reason to take us as a bride unto him forever? Or are we, like our ancestors, going to be lukewarm? We decide. And that decision influences life and death in the tribulation time frame. May he lead us to choose right thing. Shabbat Shalom.